Good morning and thank you for joining me whatever time you've chosen to watch this. It's currently about 7.30 on Sunday morning as I record. If you haven't already done so, you might like to have a look at the readings on the Benavis website, uh, in particular the passage from Isaiah where he describes the heavenly banquet to come and also the parable of the wedding feast in the Gospel reading. But first of all, I'm going to begin with a very short prayer from the epistle, the uh, uh, close of the epistle to the Philippians. Beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honourable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and anything worthy of praise, let us think on these things. Amen. Well, that's from the end of the epistle. Here is a passage that comes just towards the end of our gospel reading today. Throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. There are times as I read Matthew's gospel when I think, oh no, not again. We actually find the weeping and gnashing of teeth in five different places throughout the gospel. But I really struggle to imagine Jesus ever, see, ever saying it. Um, it just seems totally out of character with the compassion which he shows for sinners elsewhere throughout his ministry. Matthew was one of the twelve. He was with Jesus throughout that ministry. But I can't help wondering whether writing probably some 50 years later after Jesus' death and resurrection, the memories had become somewhat embellished in his mind. But that apart, it's still not an easy passage to get to grips with. I suspect we're most of us doing okay until the king comes in and spots that unfortunate individual wearing the wrong clothes. I mean, if he was a beggar dragged in off the street, as many of them were, how could he possibly be expected to have found wedding finery? Well, before we tackle that one, let's look at the context of the passage as a whole to try and get a sense of what's going on. If we look back just one chapter to the start of chapter 21, we find Jesus making his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. We know the story of Palm Sunday well, the donkey, the palm fronds laid on the road, the hosannas. It ends in the three synoptic gospels with Jesus entering the temple. Expectations must have been running high. The crowd had been singing verses from Psalm 118. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. What would the blessed one do to bring about that kingdom? Well, not what they expected. The mood changes dramatically. Jesus makes a whip and drives out the animals and the people selling them. He throws over the tables of the money changers, and all day long he polices the courtyard, allowing none of them back. It's as if he's making a point, a direct challenge to the temple authorities, but they dare do nothing for fear of the crowds. And the next day he's back again, you can almost hear a note of desperation in the voices of the elders as they ask, as we read in last week's gospel, by whose authority are you doing these things? Jesus refuses to answer. Instead, he continues to ramp up the tension with a series of parables. The parable of the two sons. One says no and then does it. The other says yes and doesn't. The parable of the wicked tenants in the vineyard who murder the servants and eventually the son of the owner. And finally, there's today's wedding banquet. Each of these parables more savagely parodies the Pharisees who are challenging Jesus today. And in the last top, the one we read today, they are the wedding guests who accept the invitation 
but when the time comes, make lame excuses, and again murder the servants sent to them. And as in other parables, Jesus looks back to a passage in Isaiah, well known to his hearers. The alien cities where the people of Israel have been held in exile are laid waste. And they have returned, literally or figuratively, to Mount Zion, where the Lord has prepared a rich feast, feast of rich food and mature wine strained clear. That idea of the heavenly banquet after, half after hard times would have been embedded deep in their psyche. And it has a certain appeal to most of us, I suspect, today as well. Look how, though, in Psalm 23, after guiding his people through the valley of the shadow of death, the Lord spreads a table before them, even in the presence of their former enemies, and the cup runs over. The holy people of Israel, the chief priests and the Pharisees, would have expected that as their lot. And so, Jesus is saying, it might have been. They would have accepted the invitation given them. In the covenant of Abraham and in the law of Moses. But when Jesus, the bridegroom, has come, comes to tell them that the time of the feast is now. They reject him. And so they will be destroyed. And the banquet given to others, the poor, the repentant sinners, not just of Israel, but of all the world. All of us, in fact. We have only to turn up. Or do we? Before the euphoria sets in, before the saliva starts to run at the thought of the rich food and the mature wines, there is a sting in the tail. On the service sheets, the gospel reading is printed as a single passage, but in many Bibles there is a paragraph break about two thirds of the way down, as if some editor was hoping we could forget about the last bit, about the man wearing the wrong clothes. Unlike today, when we head out on the high street for a new outfit as soon as we get the invitation, in those days it was the host of the wedding banquet who provided the clothes, not just for the bridesmaids and the ushers, but for every one of the guests. Socially, not wearing the outfit provided meant either that you rejected the host's gift or that you were a gatecrasher. Gate In the world of Jesus' parables, I think it puts you in the same group as those who heard the word, but in whom it had no roots and withered. Those who were prepared to accept whatever he offered, but never offered it in return to the least of his brothers and sisters. The goats rather than the sheep in that well-known image. And the writer of Matthew's Gospel really did like the sound of those words about outer darkness and the weeping and gnashing of teeth. So, what does it mean for us today, we who have been invited to the wedding feast, to be dressed in the right garb? Well, as in Jesus' time, it's to accept the gift in our case, the gift of love which God has bestowed on us through Jesus Christ, and to offer it in return to the least and the last and the lost of our brothers and sisters. Jesus tells us elsewhere, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he or she who does the will of my Father, who is in heaven. And at that point, it's up to us how we respond. And so whether we're headed for the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, or whether goodness and mercy will surely follow us all our lives, and we shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. 
Amen. Thank you for your company and we'll be online at 11 o'clock with communion. Bye now.